Uh, well, good morning. Am I on here? We're, uh, I tell you what, I am, you know, you, you find the good and the bad and everything. Uh, and, you know, we're really good at finding the bad. But one of the good things, and I was just sitting there thinking this as we were singing uh, those songs. And, uh, you know, I know Scott's just got to be shaking his head when he gets to proclaim. And he looks in there and he sees the songs that I've picked out for the week. And uh, because the beauty of what we're doing now is I don't have to worry about anybody knows these songs. I mean, we're just like, hey, the, 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 the track knows it and that's all that matters. And one thing that I love is when Debbie and Tammy go home for the night sometimes, not that I love it when they go home, but when, they're, when I'm the only one in here and I can come in this room and I can turn that on and I've got the little clicker and I'm advancing slides and I'm doing my best Scott interpretation and pressing up here and just rocking and rolling. I thought to myself, you know what, I'd invite you guys in for that. We ought to have some practice time uh, in here, you know, just learning the songs and singing together and, you know, we can be all distanced and all that. I might have them send out an email and say, okay, Shane's going to be practicing and acting a fool at this time. So come on in and we can all just uh, join. And, and Because it is, let me just tell you, I have it way louder than that in here. And it sounds awesome. And uh, it, it, is, it is a lot of fun to just sing and praise. And we, I joke about it, but I will tell you this. It is some of the most profound worship that I experience in here by myself, just literally just praising God and singing and and just uh, enjoying that time of, of listening. I mean, those voices are amazing. Um, before we get into the sermon we, uh, this morning, we have a couple of very important presentations to make. Um, now, our uh, dear sister, uh, Natalie Shinneberry, was, uh, she was baptized months and months ago, um, but we have uh, had her Bible and presentation available for her, but now with all of the craziness going on, um, we, uh, uh, we just now have the opportunity for Tim, her dad, who baptized her, to, uh, to present to her her very own study Bible, uh, from, from the church and also a baptismal certificate. And what we just learned this morning is, and we like to give um, each person who's baptized a copy of the, of the bulletin for that, uh, you know, for that Sunday. And, and her bulletin is actually a collector's item because it was the, uh, it was the sun, what, March it was March 11th. That was the, 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 uh, the last uh, week before the shutdown happened and so there was only two of those bulletins printed and she has both of them she has the, the first and the second so she has so that'll be worth a lot of money maybe one day so hang on to those but uh, we just praise God for Natalie and that amen and the second we have it didn't have to wait as long is uh, Hillary Hines come on up Hill Come on, we have a, and now Tim, her dad, who lives in her house, gave her hers, so they've already, you know, there's no cross-contamination going, and I'm living in the house with her. Um, come on, this is like the least favorite thing for her to ever do, is to be recognized. So you guys know my beautiful, ooh, I got caught there, daughter Hillary, and she was baptized last week, and we all got to experience something wonderful this morning, her very first communion uh, with all of us, which was a, a joy. So here's your study Bible with your le less valuable bulletin and baptismal certificate. Love you. Uh, so, all right, so if you've got your Bibles, let's turn over to... Uh, first Peter uh, chapter one, we're going to be looking at that briefly for a second as we ask the question, who's in charge here? And this is a, uh, this is a question that we ask because this is what caused all of the issues way back in the garden is asking who's in charge here. And so what happens is, is that we, we uh, endure, because of that question, the mystery of suffering. And we find out about that in 1 Peter, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 8. Go ahead and fill up, yeah, there we go, fill up that whole slide there. Uh, and in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, we read what we read last week. And I just kind of want to reiterate this for just a second. 
uh, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Think about that for a second, church, that what we are waiting on from God is, of, is in no danger of going bad, of being revoked, or, or of, of, uh, of somehow losing its power. He says it will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. Your salvation, you being able to, you know, as we always say, oh, I, I hope they just let me in. Oh, I hope I get in. I hope, you know, you know, all of the things we fret about as far as our salvation Yours, mine, all the saints of all uh, of the generations, your salvation is kept in heaven for you. Think about that for just a second. What can you do to mess that up? On its own, it can never uh, perish, spoil, or fade. So what are you going to do uh, to, to mess it up? There, you, know what, you know what your salvation is? Your salvation is Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. And that's exactly where he is because we know that Acts tells us. Acts tell, the Bible says our Lord and Savior, our advocate, our, uh, you know, our salvation is standing at the right hand of God now. Right now, this minute. And that's what justification means when he says that those who are in Christ, those who are baptized, just what Natalie did months ago, what sweet Hillary did last week, when she answered that call and said, I want to be in Christ. Guess what? Those two young ladies right now and forevermore standing at the right hand of the father. Amen. Because if you are in Christ, if you are baptized, you are in Christ, new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. That's Bible, folks. Stop worrying. Your salvation is kept in heaven for you. And he says, uh, God's power, the coming of the salvation that's all, that, that is ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice. Do you greatly rejoice in your salvation I don't know what it is, Scott. We just must be getting fired up up here because I'm getting out of breath too. And I don't even have my mask on yet. Do you, do you greatly rejoice or do you fret over your salvation? I, I mean, just, just, let's just think about this because we're, what we're going to get into here in a minute de it depends on whether or not we're rejoicing in our salvation or we're fretting over it. Whether we are bold, uh, saved, uh, Christ followers, or are we timid, scared, afraid to, to, do, to do anything? He said, look, you, you know, the salvation, or do you know, rejoice, you greatly rejoice. Though now, this is what we're going to get into, uh, you greatly rejoice because you are saved. Because in the end, it doesn't matter if it's COVID or the plague or persecution or wars or famines or, or whatever. It doesn't matter uh, because you greatly rejoice. But though now, you might have to face trials, of fiery trials of different kinds. Remember we talked about this last week. I, I feel like Peter is being a little bit, you know, kind of like, well, you might have to. And the people reading this might has he seen what Nero's been doing? Has he heard about what's, what's happening? Has he heard about the people who have been set on fire? The people who've been chased by bears and lions and tigers? Oh my. Has he heard about all this? The folks that have been strung up and nailed to crosses lining the streets of Jerusalem. Has he heard about that? Because if he has, he might not say you might have to face trials. He would say, hey, you're going to face trials. But then there's the other part of me that says maybe he's being a little bit sarcastic because he's saying, you know, you call yourself Christians, but you hide under the bed. And didn't he say, hey, if you're going to be the light of the world, don't set yourself under a bushel. Don't be under a basket. Don't hide under the bed. Don't blend in to the rest of the, the people to avoid what's going on. He says, because I need to remind you about this salvation that's exciting, that is protected that is uh you know that what god is saving and holding on to and making sure stays intact and in one piece and all of that for you so that you can stand up to what you're going through right now the mystery of suffering 
I use that word mystery because it's that suffering, that's a terrible marketing plan. I mean, when you're wanting people to join your cause, uh, you, you want people to think you have great things. Not, hey, come, be a Christ follower and, and enjoy the, the, the pain and anguish and suffering of going uh, against the grain, uh, going upstream in a downstream world. Come on, join us. Scott's got to hustle out of here today so nobody talk to him after church because he's got to get in on a plane and fly to somewhere remote and, and fabulous and spectacular and all that. Um, but Scott's a pilot for American Airlines, right? And, uh, and, and American Airlines wants everybody to fly American. So you know what they don't say? Hey, come fly us. We have zero leg room. I, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, hey, the, just, uh, um, you know, our peanuts are terrible. And, and uh, you know, it, no, they don't say that. They're like, oh, it's great. They, and they show pictures. They don't show pictures of the, of the seats that I can afford. They show pi- seats of the, pictures of the seats that, that, you know, others do. And they're just like, oh, it's so luxurious and so nice and just relaxed. And, oh, it's great. Oh, are we already there? No, I'm sitting there like this, you know, like trying to get one third of a, of a, you know, the armrest. And then the dude over, you know, and I'm trying to, you know, that's what I can. It, no, they don't tell you that in the brochure, do they? But, in, but Jesus comes right out and says, hey, this, this is, there, there's suffering here. And it's mysterious, the fact that he calls people and draws people to him anyway. And so we have times where we put on Christ and we think, man, this is glorious. And I want to I do that. I want to be saved. I want to have that life. I want to I be the kind of person that God wants me to be. And, 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 and so this morning, as I start out, I want to quote a very important, one of the most profound philosophers of our day. One of, uh, go ahead and put that picture up of this man, uh, a great philosopher that, that, I mean, full of wisdom. And I'm not being facetious because he said one thing that resonates with me, certainly. He says, everybody's got a plan till you get punched in the mouth. Now, one thing that Mike Tyson was not, and that is a grammarian, but I will say this, everybody got a plan till they get punched in the mouth. Because everybody thinks, I want to I serve God. I want to follow Christ. I want to do all those things. I want to be all those people. I, I want to go into all the world, and I want to preach the gospel. And man, we, they come forward, and we put on the, 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 them in baptism. We dunk them in the water. We pull them back up. We hug. We sing. We pray. And then they go out into the world, and they get punched right in the mouth. And that plan goes out the window. They get punched right in the mouth. And the next thing you know, they're like the rest of us, wrapped in bubble wrap, hanging out under the bed, just hiding, hoping nobody finds out what we stand for, what we believe, what's the truth. And, and we know we do that because we can go, uh, we can work alongside people for years. We can go to school with people for years. We can do all kinds of things. And we have songs written about us says, you never mentioned him to me. Because quite honestly, we get real sick and tired of getting punched in the mouth. You know, another great, uh, not so great thespian, but amazing philosopher, Rocky Balboa, in Rocky II says, you know, you ever get punched in the face, you know, 200 times a night? It starts to sting after a minute. Oh, does it? Yeah, you ever get punched in the mouth a couple times? It starts to hurt after a bit. So what we do is we avoid that at all costs. See, we have a plan to be Christ followers we read about the, that we read about in the pages of Scripture. Then life in a broken world happens. Then our own brokenness happens. Whether it's us going out, getting punched in the mouth by somebody who wants to tear down what we believe, who wants to make us feel silly or stupid or weak or all on any number of things for what we believe and what we do. Or it's our own brokenness that these, uh, that these two young ladies have no doubt faced is when you go, you know, you're super excited about this and I want to do the right thing and I want to be who God's calling me to be. And I go into the water and I come up and everybody claps and everybody's excited. And then I go out and the very next week I find myself doing the exact same things that I was running from when I was going after Jesus whether it's them or our own brokenness 
it doesn't take long for us to get punched in the mouth. And where's our plan then? What happens then? So this morning, when we have to talk about suffering, I have good news and I have bad news. Go ahead. The problem with Christianity is that it gets uncomfortable. The problem with Christianity is that w- what we want to have happen in the, uh, at the very beginning so time, sometimes so often doesn't happen. And suffering happens, but uh, like I said, there's good news and there's bad news. And again, the, um, uh, you know, to quote a, a movie, one, another movie is that, uh, uh, they're just coming to me, I don't know why, they're, uh, the, is in, uh, um, uh, what's the one with about Billy the Kid, um, Young Guns 2, where they're all caught and they're in this pit and they're, you know, the sheriff's being real mean to him, he comes up to him, he, sa- and the, he says, boys, I got good news and I got bad news. They're like, what's the bad news? Bad news is all we have, he's got a big shovel full of horse manure, all we have is horse manure for dinner. And they go, well, what's the good news? There's plenty of it. Well, there's good news when it comes to suffering, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that God can use our suffering to his glory. That's the good news. No matter what we go through, no matter if it's persecution or, or hatred, whether it's oppression or, 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 or anything else, God can use our suffering to his glory. The bad news is there's plenty of it. There's plenty of suffering to be used. In the kingdom, that is. In the kingdom. So we find out that there's basically, uh, there's two types of suffering that we're going to experience. The first type is the one that, uh, uh, that, that so often we don't experience. The first type of suffering that we experience in this, in this plenty, uh, this uh, plentiful cornucopia of suffering that is uh, life in the kingdom here on a broken earth is suffering for righteousness sake. When we suffer for righteousness sake, uh, sake, this is when our holiness finds itself in conflict with the brokenness of this world. This is when our new creation, our new character, remember last week when I said that that suffering doesn't build character, it reveals character? And, And again, you know, those aren't absolutes. There are times when, you know, your character can be uplifted and and be amended and things like that during hard times. But for the most part, suffering just reveals who who we are. It reveals what's already there. and, And if we can't take it, that's because we are not new creations. We're not recreated in God's image. We are not recreated by God through his Holy Spirit. And so he gives us this new character. He gives us this, uh, this newness, this holiness. And what happens is we leave the waters of baptism and we go out into this broken, lost, and dying world and we shine light into the darkness and the darkness repels and then it flanks us and then it attacks. See, suffering for righteousness' sake is we come face to face with the ruler of the air, as Jesus calls him, Satan, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's either him himself, his evil forces, or people who are wittingly or unwittingly actively working against the kingdom. You see, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10 and, and following, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount uh, you know, in his declaration of, uh, of what the kingdom looks like and what kingdom character looks like, when he goes through all of those, blessed are these and blessed are those and, and blessed, you're, you're blessed when you're a peacemaker, you're blessed when you're this. You know, he goes through this, this preamble of the constitution of the, uh, of the kingdom of God. And he says, at the very end of that, he makes no bones about it. He said, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake, because yours is the kingdom of heaven jesus states at the very beginning that being persecuted suffering for the cause suffering for the way it is not optional in the kingdom he makes that very clear because he says at the very beginning blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and then he says at the very end blessed are those who are persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven he makes he says look there's two pillars of, of being kingdom citizens. One of them 
is understanding your spiritual bankruptcy. There's nothing on earth that Rich Dooley can do to save himself. It is 100% God's work. That's what poor in spirit means. Spiritually bankrupt. Unable. We're dead in our sin. So he says, look, there, you know, those who, are, who recognize their spiritual dependence on God, they get the kingdom. And then he said, those who live according to that and are persecuted because they realize there's nothing they can do to go back and not be spiritually bankrupt. And so they're willing to suffer and die and be persecuted because of that. that that's kingdom too. And everything in between is, is what it looks like to live in the kingdom. Peacemaker? You, ever, you think you're going to suffer for being a peacemaker? Absolutely. Absolutely. A absolutely because guess what the whole thing who's in charge here you know what that tells us what who's in charge here really tells us is that you better pick a side and and, and if you don't pick my side you know if you're not with me scott what are you you're against me if you're not with me you're against me although i mean think about all the political movements of today if you're not for it, you're against it. If you're not for it, you're, you're, for, you're against it. And if you're not, and I'm for it, so if you're not for it, you're against me. Isn't that how it all works? I mean, isn't that all the things that we look, I mean, that's why, that's why right now, you, you, you don't know what to say. You, you don't know what to agree with. I, I mean, do, uh, uh, you know, we don't know what to say. Do black lives matter? Absolutely. Does the, does the organization, I, I, I don't I mean, you know, is it Marxist? Is it this? I don't know what to say. You know what all I can do is just hug people and love on folks. And I mean, you got people that want to, you know, kneel for this. And then there's people that are getting said, no, it's not about that. It's about this other thing. Well, it doesn't matter. I don't believe it. So I'm against you. That, that's where we're at. That, that's where we're at. And it should come as no surprise. Because try to be a peacemaker. You'll be at war with somebody. I promise you. I mean, just, and that's just one of the Beatitudes. That's just one of them. And so it makes, you know, one of the most frustrating things about Jesus to me is that he never answered the question. And now I'm finally realizing why. Because the question has no answer that's going to satisfy everyone. Blessed are the peacemakers. Sure. Sure they are. Read down to the rest of the chapter. They're going to get persecuted. They're going to get persecuted. So, that, so there's, this, there's this suffering for the sake of righteousness that is, uh, uh, that's one that we typically avoid, but there's one that we don't avoid. There's one other type of suffering that we don't avoid, and that is suffering that I like to call self-inflicted wounds. Those are the, the suffering that is due to our own sinfulness. These are self-inflicted wounds. There, there's a little known fact that we only find out after the fact. And that is, no matter what you do, no matter what sin you're caught up in, no matter what you try to, uh, to do or hide or, or you know, rationalize or, or sterilize, whatever it is, no matter what the sin is, it all causes suffering. Our sin causes our suffering. That's why God says don't do it. You see, the, at its core, absolutely, sin separates us from God. In, in the garden, which is what started this whole conversation, in the garden, sin, uh, the, the desire to be God, the desire to determine right and wrong, the desire to, uh, to, to be the masters of our own destiny, that, that sin, that, separ you know, that separated us from God and brought in death, right? You know, wages of sin are death. So at its core, sin separates us from God. So then God has this plan from, from all along, even before we sin, he had this plan that, that he puts into motion where he brings us back to him and, and he brings us back to him through uh, his own mercy, his own justice, his own grace. And so, and, and that's the one thing that we can't change, fix or, or, or mess up. 
is God's grace. We can only accept it or, again, go our own way, and we determine what's righteous, and we make our own righteousness. Or if we surrender to his righteousness. So, so sin at its core separates us from God. But once we're reunited with God, sin had, no longer has that power over us. Read, you know, I, I'm almost out of time. I don't have, read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Sin has no more mastery, has no more power over us. Oh, we still do it, but it no longer separates us from God. It causes suffering, though. So God says, don't do it. I mean, that's, that's why we don't sin. That's why we, we, we flee from sin, because it, it causes suffering. Come up with a sin that, you, you know, even those, those uh, um, you know, victimless crime sins, just the ones I do to myself and all, you know, come up with a sin that doesn't cause suffering. I'll wait. I, I mean, we'll be here all day. You know, you, you lie to someone and they never find out about it still damages your relationship with them because now you have something to hide i mean big things or small things they still cause suffering that that's the reason that god doesn't want us to sin because it hurts us don't commit adultery well okay what if i did but oh but she never found out or well it's not just beat up on the guys what if he never found out well, you're still suffering. Because now, now there's this, this rift in your relationship. There's this scar. There's this something. There, there's this, and, and you can never come clean. You can never, you have this weight that you are carrying. Whether they know or they don't know, you have this weight. And it's a ruiner of relationships. Talk to anyone in a healthy, godly relationship, and they will tell you it is the greatest thing that's ever happened to them. It's a great, it is the most amazing experience to be with someone in all of their flaws and to have that healthy, godly, selfless relationship. That's why he says don't do some of these things that we find ourselves doing because it, it hurts us. I mean, we need to get over the fact that I'm going to bad deed my way out of God's favor. I didn't good deed my way into God's favor. I'm not going to bad deed my way out of it. He's just saying that whenever you sin, it causes suffering. And if you suffer enough, you might leave him thinking the grass might be greener somewhere else. See, that's the only, that is the only threat to our salvation is us. Just like we made a decision to follow him, us making a decision not to. And it's not arbitrary. It's not on accident. It isn't like, you know, oh, I messed up and fell out of God's grace. It's as intentional as those waters were that got you there. But we suffer enough at our own hands. No telling what we're liable to do. Because, because I just, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't handle the guilt. I can't handle, and, so, and that's why people turn and then they were, they, they were in God's grace and then they turn and they, oh, there is no God. Because the guilt of doing what God says don't do because it hurts you no matter what. And they say, well, if I just figure out a way for that guilt not to be there, then the suffering for doing what I want to do will go away. And so they leave God only to find out that the suffering's there waiting on. See, we'll suffer. That's the mystery of suffering, is that in a broken world, you're going to suffer either way. And that's the bad news. The good news is that God can use both. That God can use both. The, the, you know, obviously, the suffering for the sake of the gospel, the suffering for his righteousness sake, the ones that when he says, blessed are you who are persecuted, blessed are you who when people insult you and, and fight you and, and, and beat you up and all of those things for my name's sake, yours is the kingdom of heaven. That is, that's obvious. God uses that because no matter what the world throws at me, no matter how harsh they are, no matter how much they beat me, take my stuff, abuse my family, nothing, nothing will come between me and God. And just like Job, I will say, Say, even though he slay me, I will serve God. Even if he took my life, 
my dying breath is, God, thank you for finding me faithful. No matter what, they'll come what may. Bring it on. Is that all you got? God can use that kind of suffering, that kind of persecution for his glory because people say, look at what's going on with that guy. If, it, if God was not real, if the Holy Spirit was, was not in him, strengthening him, empowering him or her, there is no way they could stand up to that. God's got to be real. And then there's the using of our sin, which God can do that as well. Because when we sin, we don't just sin against, we sin against other people. And we cause suffering in their lives. And, and when they stand up to that, it, that's back again to the stand, you know, suffering for righteousness sake. But then, when we continue to sin, God's grace continues to abound. Now, Paul would deal with that and say, well, should I sin all, even more? Well, no. Well, No. But what he's saying is that, let me, let me ask you this. Have you ever known a, a, a parent that has a child that is just so mean and abusive to them? So disrespectful. So, uh, so go their own way. But that parent is just continually praying for and giving and loving and accepting and offering and all those things. What do you think about that parent? You think, man, that parent is, is uh, that parent loves unconditionally. Now, th- th- please, let's not dissect the, you know, tough love versus that, that. I'm just saying, if someone can take abuse after abuse after abuse and still keep pouring out love, pouring out love, pouring out love, you don't think less of them. Them, you think how do they do that See, that's what god does when we over and over and over he's that father standing on the on the, the the front lawn looking for that prodigal son even though that son has gone off and squandered and acted and all those things and acted out and all that he comes and when 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 that son returns to him there isn't judgment there isn't i told you so there isn't make it up to me there isn't all those things it's just 100 percent lavish giving back to him he sees his son uncomfortable he sees his son barefoot walking miles on unpaved rocky roads what does he do he gives him shoes. he says get shoes on his feet now your pain ends here your discomfort ends here you don't take another step in agony he sees all of the the the, the mess on him all of the manure and the mud and all that from the pig pen and, and all those things and so he brings the robe and it's that robe of royalty and he takes and he drapes him with he says nobody he doesn't persecute any longer he doesn't put you down or or or, you know fillet you in front of everyone and say look you know be shamed he says no one sees you like this it's between me and you because i can take it they can't they can't take this but nobody see he doesn't he doesn't you know wipe him off and all those things you know yeah the the bath and all that comes later but the acceptance is this unconditional and he says put my royalty over your sinfulness and your dirt and your sweat and all of the all of that brokenness that you bring in here i'm going to cover that he says oh, you look famished would you like a sandwich that's not what he says he says you look famished today we feast we feast today i'm not just offering you some crackers i'm not just offering you a crust of bread i'm not just offering you a glass of water he says bring the finest of what we have in store all of the wine all of the drink all of the food everything because today we feast you think god can't use our sin to his glory Now, what he says is that we don't just go on sinning so grace may abound by no means. By no means. But if you think for one second that your self-inflicted wounds are more than what God can cover, (laughs) I've got some good news for you. I've got some good news for you. 
Because God will love you. He will comfort you. He will cover up your multitude of transgressions. And He will be seen for what He is. One thing is that no matter how much He loves us, if we keep on sinning, His holiness will not be compromised. His holiness will not be compromised. If we want to be away from God, His holiness will allow that. As hurt as it will be, as devastating to Him as that is, His holiness will allow Him to say, go your own way. Let me tell you something. If my kids ever did that, I would be broken in pieces. Broken. I don't don't know if I could let them. I don't know if my holiness is, is that strong. I would probably it, capture them and hold them hostage in my home. But God doesn't. He loves us perfectly. And he's glorified because his holiness will not be compromised. But in that same breath, an uncompromising holiness accepts the broken back to his glory. There's good news and there's bad news. For those in Christ, however, praise God, we're only left with good news. Scott's going to come up and he's going to lead us in a song. Then we're going to have a prayer and then we're going to be dismissed. This week, you have an opportunity to face suffering. Will it be at your own hand? Or will it be for his righteousness? Will you join me as together we stand and sing?